She's probably going to sit for a few minutes until she gets bored. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Hi. What's the name again? I didn't hear it. Just cut out. Hi. Glad to have you. And I will invite you to, there's another chat feature, which is that you can send a chat to one person individually. And um, if you're looking at the chat in the two uh, section, it says two and you can choose. And I just ask you to send a chat to one other person on the call just to say hi and uh, ask them a question, any question. <laughs> And Radia, would you um, prepare to go through our muting protocol and that kind of stuff? Sure. And I think you can just probably go ahead and do that while people are still typing. Radia, will you just go ahead and talk about our muting culture? Sure. Sorry, I I sidetracked in the comments. Um, so yeah. Well, guys, what <laughs> what we want to do? I'm still looking at the comments. Sorry. Is just um, when you are not speaking, just to limit the background noise. If you could mute yourself. Um, I will also likely just to keep the flow of things um, when we have one speaker just mute everyone so that um, we can limit the background noise. Um, so you'll find that at the bottom of your screen you'll see the microphone. You can just click it to mute yourself and then of course when you want to talk just remember to unmute so that we can hear you. Great. I think that we're ready to go on ahead into the spiritual power moment, and you're up on deck again. Sweet. Okay. So I um, I really wanted to do this. I have five minutes, right? Yes. Okay. I probably won't take that entire time, but maybe I will because I can be long-winded. Um, but I really wanted to take this opportunity to do this because um, a lot has been weighing on my mind and my heart lately. And I think that, well, I hope that what I have to say can be a blessing to someone. Um, so we all are living crazy lives. We all have so much going on. We all are busy with work, with school, with raising families. And on top of all of that, we have chosen to do the very difficult work of racial justice organizing. Sometimes it's rewarding. Sometimes it can just be downright stressful. Sometimes you feel anger, you feel sadness, and it, it's a lot to deal with. Um, and I think as of late, for me personally, what with everything that I've had going on um, as I prepare to move and start school and different things, um, a lot has been weighing on me emotionally. And so I've been looking for spiritual outlets to kind of alleviate some of that 
strain. And um, this week, you know, I'm, I'm starting something where I have my Bible verse of the week that um, is something that I can lean on in the midst of my struggles or just, you know, feeling down or feeling like I need to be uplifted. Um, and so this week, the verse that has been on my heart, um, it comes from First Peter chapter 5, and I would love to share it with you all. I hope that it blesses you in the way that it's really provided me comfort and blessed me in the midst of my crazy week. Um, so I'll just read a little bit of it and leave you to simmer with it. Um, so it says, it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. And this is my part. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in your faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So again, I hope that that sits well with all of you. I hope that it blesses you in the way that it's blessed me, and it gives you the peace, the strength, and the courage to continue moving forward um, with this work. Thank you. Thank you, Radia. And a welcome to someone calling in from the 215 area code. Um, who is it? Kimberly Kozan Flory. Hi, Kimberly. Um, I'll just change your name on the screen. Um, after we're just in between the spiritual power moment and the welcome to the web event. So we'll move into introductions in a few minutes. So welcome to the call. Um, <clears throat> You are the ninth caller. Um, so I want to welcome people who are here today. I want to welcome people who are here on one of these clinics for the first time ever. Um, I want to welcome people who already identify as an organizer or a leader and people who are just trying out those concepts or don't know if they fit you. I want to welcome people who are connected to the Church of the Brethren, which is the main um, constituency out of which Honor Peace comes. And I also want to welcome everyone who's affiliated with other traditions. And so let's hear what some of those other ones are. I also participated in the Lutheran House Church. Who else? You can unmute yourself and speak up. I am Church of the Brethren, and I also participate in a Buddhist Sangha. This is Kimberly. What else? Uh, this is Bill. I'm sort of an ecclesiastical homeless person, and I roam the churches of Lake County from time to time. I'm Scott, and I'm a Quaker that has membership and is uh, going to soon be ordained in Church of the Brethren. Excellent. Wonderful. And, and other identities that haven't been spoken. We welcome everyone in. I also want to welcome people who identify as people of color, people who are white, people who identify as mixed, people who are Latino or Hispanic, who have Asian roots or black or native. I want to welcome everyone into this call um, with all of our full selves. Chibusa, I want to turn it over to you for the purpose of the community of practice and resistance. Hey everybody, uh, this web event is part of the community of practice and resistance. We call it racial justice organizing community of practice and resistance. And what we are attempting to do is provide a space for people to come together around our common interest to work for racial justice in our own networks, congregations, and traditions. So this can take a variety of forms. Some of the folks that are in our community of practice are pastors, and they are looking to organize their congregation. Um, some of our folks are um, 
in a family that has persons of color and white folks, that's an interracial family, and are trying to navigate those um, relational uh, nuances. Um, there's a whole wide range of reasons why folks are connected here. Our goal, though, is to equip you and encourage you for whatever your racial justice organizing looks like, whether it's how to speak with the truth and love around the Thanksgiving table with folks who don't share your um, politics, or whether it's mobilizing your congregation to um, have a more public and political uh, protest or rally. So that's our goal here. Um, and we have an 18 month set of goals that we just, within the past two months, created a steering committee that is um, steering us in, in, in those goals. Matt and Radia and I are part of it as the staff. Um, some of you may know Dina um, Jennings from Virginia. She is chairing our steering committee. Um, Ryan, Brian Hanger, who um, served with the, Nat, the, Na the Office of Public Witness, um, now as a Bethany student, he's our recorder. Um, and then Beth Gunzel is also on that steering committee. Um, and we're going to talk more about this later, but just to um, give you more of a sense of what this specific event is. Primarily, the organizing clinics are for setting goals, um, and we'll walk through what that looks like as we continue our time together this afternoon. But we have a Facebook group. Um, OEP actually has several different um, platforms on social media, but we have a group called Mutually Accountable Kingdom Seekers, which is a group made up of folks. Um, I've tried to add all of you that I knew were going to be on this call if you weren't already in the group. Um, and we'll utilize that tool later to actually write down our goals in that public setting so that it breeds accountability and encouragement and we can talk again more about that later. Does that sound good for going back to you, Matt? Hello, hello, sorry, yeah, I was muted. Do you see a slide in front of you now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, in each one of these clinics, we like to present just a little bit of thinking about what it is that an organizer does. And so I'm gonna share a couple of thoughts in the next uh, five to six minutes. So here we go. We're saying we're having an organizing clinic, and what does that mean? It's not just, and what is organizing? It's not just mobilizing. Mobilizing, we often think of getting people together to come out in the streets for a protest. Mm -hmm. Mobilizing is important and it has its place. Um, but when we talk about organizing, that's not the only thing we're talking about. And it's not just advocating. And when I say advocating, I'm not just talking about legislative advocate, advocacy, but I'm talking about um, becoming an articulate spokesperson on the issue and you're the one who always stands up and says the thing about why we need to get involved with racial justice or climate change. That's a part of organizing, but when we talk about organizing, there's a deeper quality to it that, um, that includes that kind of articulate leadership, but it's also more than that. So when we talk about organizing, we're talking about long, slow work that's building or enhancing the capacity for people to come together around common concerns forging new relationships and investing in new structures. <clears throat> and those of you who have been here before have seen this image of a weaving that we're taking threads and yarn that already exist and in the work of organizing, we're weaving relationships and individuals and groups into something new, something beautiful that can serve a new purpose. Or we're planting a garden or tending a garden that someone else has, um, has planted. So what kind of behaviors do an organizer, does an organizer carry out? For example, one, pay attention. Notice what's happening with your group related to your area of concern. 
So the behavior there is observation and reflection. So that's to say, not um, in addition to being fired up about your issue, you're becoming curious about the group that you want to organize. Are they involved? Are they not? What's easy for them to get involved in and what's not? What do they need for their own next step of development? You're staying tuned to the Kairos moment, which me means reflecting on what the Holy Spirit is doing, what's happening in the broader movement, and how you might connect. So the key behavior there is spiritual disciplines um, and putting out your feelers um, to the divine and to the movement to see what the possibilities are for your own group to be involved in the broader movement. And finally, building relationships. And that means identifying one or more other people who might share your concerns and set up a meeting with them. <clears throat> you share your dreams and you ask for theirs. And depending on who you're meeting with and what the context is, you might pray together. Um, so the key behavior there is one-to-one -one meetings, um, which are brief and focused, but relational and saying, I really ca am carrying a passion and a, a burden about this issue and this movement right now. Where are you? What's happening with you? What's your connection to it? To kind of unlock new kinds of possibilities. Um, I think I'm going to stop sharing the screen and come on back. And, and I think that's where I'm going to leave it for today. Um, I would invite folks um, who have chat to just put in one sentence of reflection about what I just shared as we transition to the next point. One sentence of reflection into the chat to everyone. And those of you who aren't on chat, Dean or Kimberly, if you'd like to make a brief comment, um, I'd love to hear from you. I'll unmute you, Dean. Do you have a comment? Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. I'm just learning. <laughs> okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. Kimberly? I love that idea of um, time management that's also relational of how to um, set up one-on-one -on -one meetings to share um, our visions and goals so that we might build a relationship and synergy um, teamwork in the community. Thanks, Kimberly. Um, Radia, we're about to go into pairs. Do you have those set up? And I can say a word about what we're doing in the pairs? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Great. So um, we're going to put you into pairs. There, because we're an odd number, there may be someone left in the main room, or we'll just see what it's. There's always some quirk with this, but it usually overall works pretty well. What I'd like you to talk about is what is your context of organizing? Like when you're here at the organizing clinic, who are you thinking you're organizing? Um, as an example, I'm here thinking about my Church of the Brethren congregation here in Portland and then share a little bit about that group. And then say, um, so describe them and share your hopes or successes or obstacles related to activating them. So it could be a congregation, it could be your neighborhood, it could be your community, um, but each of you will have something like three or four minutes to share, and Radio will bring us back um, uh, at 30 minutes after the hour. Sweet, all right, breaking out now. Hello there. Hi, is it you and me? I can hear you. Can you hear me fine? I can, sure. Good. All right. So it actually, it looks like, <laughs> okay. 
Um, so why don't you start by telling me, like, who, who is your focus? What groups are you looking at primarily? We have a um, racial justice and fairness group that meets in our house once a month. Um, it uh, kind of is a, a upstart of a few frustrated people um, who began meeting a couple of years ago. And um, you know, so we have uh, representatives from a number of churches. We have uh, uh, and faith traditions um, uh, who meet our group. Um, the monthly meetings will range from anywhere from 10 people to about 30 people. And um, uh, we have... Um, Narrowed things down, we've identified three things that we're really trying to accomplish. One is um, we're uh, trying to increase diversity among the teachers in our um, county's largest school district. Um, we have a pretty, we have a, a pretty diverse school district, but uh, no diversity among the teachers, mm -hmm. or very little. Um, we are trying to increase some uh, political um, participation, uh, just being present. It, uh, the county commission, county council meeting, city council meeting, school board meetings, um, and then we're uh, this season we're trying to we've set a goal of uh, recruiting in uh, 100 brand new voters and making sure that they get to the polls. Um, the reason we came together a couple years ago and continue on now is um, a characteristic of our uh, region here is everybody is very self sufficient. There's a lot of duplication. Uh, the NAACP doesn't really talk to the um, uh, uh, Indiana Democratic uh, African American uh, Council. There's so, um, uh, and we view ourselves really as uh, connectors to those groups where you know, we have representatives from most um, uh, concerned groups, like minded people, uh, and we try to you know, bring those strings together. We're not trying to create um, another entity, really. We're just trying to facilitate communication between the entities. Um, for instance, there's a, a new group here called PUSH, Pray Until Something Happens, which is an African-American youth group. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they had a, uh, a peace day on Friday afternoon, and then on the very next day, on Saturday, there was a unity picnic sponsored by another small group. Um, and what we're trying to do is get these together where we could have had, we, in that sense, we could have had one larger, uh, more effective community event. So um, that's who I'm representing is uh, uh, our uh, still unnamed group of concerned folks that meet in our house. Mm -hmm. And so, because you said you guys do these meetings once a month. Right. So about how many people are showing up and like what, what is like how are your meetings worked is it are they facilitated are they moderated discussions how does that typically work yeah we we set an agenda uh for the evening and they are moderated mm -hmm. um, we uh, with the exception of my wife and i and uh, my son uh, everybody else in our group is uh, a person of color we have people from afghanistan one person from Afghanistan, one, two people from Iran, and everybody else is African American. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you know, we are not a diverse group um, in the sense that we are um, uh, evenly multiracial, but we do represent a number of traditions. So, and we work through now that we've set these goals. Um, we set, we work through how we're doing on these. And um, for instance, three of us met with the superintendent just this past Tuesday. Uh, which is our second meeting with him, just to discuss the problem of lack of diversity among greater Clark uh, County school district teachers. So, um, and we assign uh, not everybody who comes to our meetings uh, necessarily, or not, you know, there are people involved who don't come to the meetings. Uh, we have people who will go to city council meetings and take notes and share that back with the rest of the group. So, um, uh, in school board meetings. So it's, um, you know, we are agenda driven and then we try to, as my wife always reminds us, let's quit talking and start doing something. Yeah. So that's, um, we really are trying to become an action group. Um, we are, you, know, you may not know where we are in Southern Indiana. We're part of the Louisville Metro. Um, oh, so, yeah. So we are, uh, but because there's a river, a big river and a state line, we really don't get included in like the surge group in Louisville or you know, Black Lives Matters in Louisville. So, I mean, we can, um, we are communicating with those groups, but there's not an active chapter of those groups in our 
uh, on our side of the river. So we're uh, trying to work with those groups and kind of uh, augment what they're doing in, uh, in the Louisville metro. Nice. That, I mean, that's that's really great work. <laughs> I oh, know that it's um, it's tough, but necessary. We have a problem uh, just culturally here. We have a problem with African Americans, particularly um, just um, uh, not being very uh, assertive in mm. every time. So, um, you know, in inclusion seems to be enough sometimes and just being included in the meeting seems to seems to satisfy folks rather right. than actually moving the agenda forward so right uh, and just because you're invited to a meeting with the mayor doesn't mean the mayor is going to do anything so what we're trying to do is uh, uh, take the next step from inclusion to actually causing some change so mm -hmm. right nice so it looks like we only have a couple minutes left but just briefly um no it's okay i love hearing about other people's work um so i you know i graduated from howard university in 2014 oh, part of washington dc thank you um and i let you know when we think about racial justice issues and we want or the dc metro area wants the student voice they tend to come to howard mm -hmm. and i think that's primarily because Howard is a historically black college and university wow. and it, you know, it has a high um, persons of color population. So it's easy to get black people to talk about the issues if you come to Howard. And so there's um, been a lot of organizing groups on campus that have arisen who want to do something, um, who have, I think, righteous anger, but don't really know what steps they need to take to bring about positive change. Right. Um, and so I've been using this platform as a way to really like define and understand organizing, be strategic about those steps and then take it back to them so that they can have a better understanding of how to move forward. Um, and then so the second part of that is I'll be moving to Chicago in about three weeks to begin a master's program at the University of Chicago. So I'm hoping sure. to um, mobilize and do the same kinds of things there. Yeah, that sounds great. Awesome. Good for you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to close this out because we have okay. to go back to the main room now. So I will see you there. Good talking to you. You too. Thanks. Dean, you're sitting on the wall now. I'm, I'm here now. Hi, Kimberly. Hello. Hi. I didn't, huh? Are the phone, the phone people able to be moved into a group or were we not able to? You should have been in a group. I should have been in a group? Yeah, the phones do work in the breakouts, so I'm not sure what happened. No one else showed up there? I was trying to talk to them about um, how to um, unmute themselves and things like that. And I kept it on the whole time, but, um, you know, I never, never did. But I did a hangout message to Rydia, just so she knows, kind of, I articulated to myself <laughs> the question and uh, okay. what I would, what I seek prayer for. Okay, thanks. We'll try and troubleshoot that. I will, yeah. Okay, great. Um, and I'll be leaving this conversation in not too long, so blessings to you all, but I would love to follow up with um, either a kind of a accountability partner or a staff member in the next week, if possible. Okay, that's awesome. And I know Chibusa will be inviting folks to put goals in the um, Facebook group Facebook later, so yeah. that's one thing that you I'll can do. Okay. Thank you.
Great. Thanks, Kimberly. Sorry about the mix up. Um, okay, friends. So we're going into the next part of the call, which is actually the bulk of the call. And um, this is um, a time for success stories and obstacles or questions. The format for this, I mean, when we say this is an organizer clinic, we do provide some front matter like you've already experienced, but this is a time to hear from each other and um, uh, to inspire each other, but also to seek advice from one another in the cases that we may need to. Um, so the structure for it is that several people will get five minutes in the center, quote unquote. And in the five minutes, you can use that time how you like. You could use the whole five minutes to tell us the story and just have us hear and witness what you're thinking about and experiencing as an organizer. You could talk for two minutes and pose a question, like, here's my situation. We're working on this, we're getting stuck there. Can you give me some advice? And then get feedback from the group for three more minutes. And I'll keep track of the five minutes and we'll do it somewhat rigorously around the time limit. So if you do speak for the whole five minutes, that'll be the end of your time. Um, but it's up to you how you spend it. And there won't be quite enough time for every person to um, have time in the center, but we found that oftentimes everybody doesn't want it or it kind of works out okay. So um, I think now is a time to ask who wants to take some time in the center and share your story or a success you've had recently or an obstacle that you've been encountering and get feedback or wisdom from the group if you want it. Um, yes, Barb, you're up. This is very basic. How does a white woman make racial justice work? That's it. That's all. That's my question. Go for it. Five minutes. You guys give me the answer. <laughs> way to use the way to use the community, Barb. <laughs> all right. Who'd like to take a, a Jim? I know that you've been doing some creative work in your part of Southern Indiana as a white person, and I wonder if you would be willing to um, give Barb some nuggets. Um, I think that um, um, that's a, uh, it's difficult, and I think it comes um, primarily through relationship. So um, uh, we have been, um, my wife and I, my family and I, I should say, um, have been uh, involved with uh, NAACP and most recently with uh, some other uh, organizations and political organizations. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's been a decade in the making, I think, um, where um, you know, there's, a, um, there's a lot of white liberals um, who, um, uh, it's a uh, kind of an academic, kind of a theoretical thing, um, uh, to be uh, open-minded, um, and uh, but I think it comes primarily through relationships. We have an advantage, uh, I was telling Radia a few minutes ago, uh, we have a group that meets in our house every month uh, to kind of plot some strategy, and most of those people are African-American, and, um, uh, and they are um, uh, our friends. And when we um, uh, work together now, there is a, uh, a sense that we really are together not just um, uh, you know, a, a, a white person doing some sort of um, uh, penance out of white guilt. So um, I think it's a relationship thing. And, I, and Matt, you mentioned earlier, it's, this is long, slow work. Um, and I think we need to put the work in on the front end to build relationships. And this is something everybody already knows, of course, but um, uh, and then I think those relationships will uh, bear fruit. Um, and, you know, are there, you know, are we willing to um, uh, hang in for the long haul or is this just uh, a reaction to a book we recently read or, um, you know, are we um, um, really, um, you know, uh, going to stand in the trenches, uh, you know, with our you know, African-American brothers and sisters? And 
So I find that to be something that um, is kind of laid the foundation for us. And, um, you know, it's, um, and I think also um, uh, we fight the tendency to, um, to kind of be in charge. I mean, um, um, you know, some of us may have had positions where we uh, have been in charge at work or something like that, but being able to step back and be supportive uh, rather than um, you know, trying to drive this thing all the time is important. How did you start it out? You know, there was a group of disgruntled folks um, who felt like the NAACP here in my county uh, was um, not really doing uh, enough. So um, in, you know, we regularly attend those meetings and one of these people, um, we just began to talk over lunch one time, what can we do? And uh, we began to not to replace any other organization that exists, um, but we really have uh, formed this small group to try to facilitate cooperation between several organizations. And um, so it really began from somebody just asking the question, we're not doing enough, what more can we do? And there's plenty of groups, for crying out loud, um, you know, who have good missions, um, but you know, to try to facilitate some forward movement, um, um, I think um, has taken a little bit um, uh, a different approach for us where we are uh, trying to, as uh, Matt mentioned earlier, trying to weave these um, uh, characteristics together. We are trying to get these silo groups. Uh, we are kind of be trying to become the conduits from one silo to another silo where people aren't just duplicating work or doing work in a vacuum. So. Okay, thanks. Let me mention a totally different approach. Thank you, Jim. Jim was uh, talking about a multicultural group of people coming together to be change agents and catalysts. There's another major approach that's out there right now, which is white people working together, but in solidarity and accountability with people of color groups. And the main group that's doing that organizing on the national level is called Showing Up for Racial Justice. Um, there is a chapter, it's more than we can talk about right now, but there is a chapter in Denver. And as a matter of fact, their monthly meeting is tonight. And I just sent you a link to their Facebook group so that you can see what they're doing in their meeting tonight. Okay. And uh, it might be worth checking out. Yeah. Okay, thanks. To get support for what you're doing there. Okay. Okay, great. Who's next? Thanks for stepping up first, Barb. <laughs> Uh, Barb, do you want to invite someone to see if they want to take a turn? And if they don't, they can pass it on to someone else. Um, sure. Let's see. How about, I'm not going to say your name right. Is it Radia? There you go. Okay. So I have to think, because um, I've been, I feel like I've been, I've been a little slacky lately with, um, my work, I do a lot of, like, primarily what I do is on social media. Um, I do a lot of, mm, a lot of tweeting and retweeting, blogging, writing, things like that. Um, oh, you know what? Actually, that's not true. I'll go back. <laughs> um, this is actually, um, what I can share is what we talked briefly about in the July organizer clinic. Um, somebody brought up the concept of ally theater, which is something that I had never heard of before. And it's in a nutshell, when white people perform for the purpose of like proving their allegiance to marginalized populations without actually really like being dedicated to the cause. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because I obviously, like, I, I, you know, I have white friends. I know a lot of people that I consider to be white allies. And so, like, this idea of, um, of being, like, an ally for the purpose of, like, getting credit or something was, like, insane to me. I was like, oh, my God, I want to read so much more about this. 
Um, and so Chibuso shared a link and I read up on that and I said, well, I want to share this with my networks and see what people think about this. Because like I said, it was new to me. I don't know if the concept is new as a whole, but it was certainly new to me. Um, and I got a cu some good feedback from a couple of friends um, who, in some regards, I guess it's good that you passed it to me, Barb, because like, I think this piggybacks a little bit off of what you were saying and what they've found difficult is like, how to be a good ally or like how as a white person to do the racial justice work, especially in the age um, of social media, of internet, where everything is like broadcast online. Like how do you show your allegiance to a cause publicly without making it seem like I'm just posting this for likes or for show or whatever, you know? So what that did for me, um, was it, it really like, it made me have conversations with them. Like one of them is actually one of my really good, um, work friends. Her name is Mindy and she's super great. Um, but it made me have conversations with her because, and it made me, as I think a person of color, look at how we are open to white people talking about these issues. And I find that there's sometimes a disconnect because I think that um, on one hand, we want to have conversations, but on the other hand, we don't want to be spoken for. So there has to be there has to be a common ground there. And I think it forced me to confront a little bit more what that common ground is. Um, and unfortunately, I can't say that I have answers or like, you know, resources for what can be done. But I think, you know, a success to me is always just being able to think about something differently. Um, and so having those conversations and getting to hear those perspectives from white people who believe themselves to be allies and who I also believe to be allies was helpful for me. And it helped me to kind of, um, I think, figure out how to approach going forward, dealing with um, white people and racial justice issues. So that's my little tidbit. All right, thanks. Yep. You have about 45 seconds if you want to do anything oh, else. Oh, okay. Um, 45 seconds, I guess I'll popcorn it to somebody. Um, let's see. Dean, how about you? Okay. <laughs> um, I was just telling Shibuzo, I belong to a small group that um, has been studying different books over the time and uh, on both psychological issues, theological, social justice. But um, So I brought up the idea of studying the book uh, Trouble I've Seen by Drew Hart. Um, and the first reaction was, oh, we, we, we are all familiar with that. We know all about it. Uh, but I finally talked to him in getting into it, and that, so we're into about chapter four now, and and I think they begin to are begin to see the the need the need for it. So that's I felt good about that. Uh, the probably the most frustrating thing is as a white person being in the middle of. I mean, people people I talk to think. Well, I mean, I'm not prejudiced, you know, I wouldn't, and, but growing up in a racist society that is, uh, it's, it's sort of like, I guess, a fish in the water, you think, don't know, the fish doesn't know the water's there, and, and so part of the difficult part is getting beyond that. Um, there was an interesting uh, thing online, you can, a little quiz you can do to, to uh that's an emotional type thing that tell, indicates whether you have an unconscious racism which i thought was interesting i i recommended that to people um and 
Um, the next chapter in our book is on whiteness matters. And so I got a, I found a, a, a sheet called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, which uh, was, it was interesting to me. It was, when you talk about white privilege, people, you know, white people in general, what's that? You know, I don't have any privilege. <laughs> but when, as you read over the details, you know, oh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's got some real interesting, uh, it was, it was very enlightening for me. And I think I'd asked, I get passed it out the last meeting and asked him to be ready to talk about the next meeting. So we'll see how that goes. But, um, yeah, I guess, uh, my fr most frustration is just how to get beyond that. Uh, I mean, I grew up in a s small town in Ohio where it was all white. If somebody had asked me, you know, I would have said there wasn't anybody prejudiced in this town, you know. <laughs> um, until I went away, I, w I w went to the BVS for a couple of years and uh, worked in the inner city of Chicago. And, and when I came back, I saw all kinds of things I hadn't seen before, and it's because I wasn't sensitized to it at all. So, yeah, one one thing I am seeing in all three of the folks that have shared is this real need for education, um, primarily in white circles, around what racism actually is. Um, and we've we've gotten into that a lot the past three or four days, actually, on Facebook, because there seems to be some disagreement between prejudice and racism. And we use those terms interchangeably, but they're two vastly different things. Um, racism is a system. It is a system that is designed to benefit white people, to benefit men, to benefit straight people, to benefit, I mean, it's a, we live in a patriarchal, cis-sexist, heterosexist, you know, white supremacist <coughs> system. Um, and th that's what racism is. Prejudice is a, tr is a different thing altogether. And while I think combating prejudice is important, um, you calling me a coon doesn't matter to me one bit if I have food, I have clean drinking water, I have the same access to education. I, you know, all of the, those are systemic issues that are racism. Um, and I, I think a lot of times we try to combat prejudice and think that because mm -hmm. I don't say any blatantly offensive things, I'm not racist. Well, that might mean you're not prejudiced. Um, but you can be prejudiced without calling people the N-word, right? You know, um, I don't know how many people who were friendly to me until I asked out their white daughter, and then that they weren't friendly anymore, right? So there's a difference between being friendly to persons of color and being anti-racist. Very different things. And I think a theme that I heard through all three of those is when we're interacting in predominantly white spaces or even in multi-ethnic spaces, there's a real need for education. Jonathan and I, we met for an hour and a half before we came here for lunch. And one of the things that Jonathan was talking about is wishing that there was like a glossary that you could go to and for, just for educational purposes and thinking about how great that would be for the three of us on the OP racial justice staff to put together something and it's just like a primer on you know the language that we use because when we do use language interchangeably that's not that's not always helpful and it confuses people um, who are trying earnestly to work um, and trying to show up. Uh, thanks, Chabu. So, Radia, would you read out that comment as we transition? There's yes, a I will. This is from Scott. You can see it in your chat. Um, he says, one thing that comes to mind is that I can't make justice happen, though I have faith that it will, and faith that I have an important role in the process, as is now is the time to act on behalf of also, I need to remember that if there is justice, a lot of people are not going to accept what that looks like, including me. So I work on relationships and overcoming my own prejudices. Thanks for that, Scott. 
um, in terms of glossary, there are some really great ones out there. And I was just reading one that came out from, I think it's Movement for Black Lives. I'm looking for the link, but I'll post it. It was like, um, that was just, just came out a couple weeks ago, a new glossary for terms in the movement. <clears throat> uh, so I'm, I'll share it just because it's there, not because it's the only one that we would want to use. What's, what's, it might not even be the best introductory one with white folks that you're introducing, but I'll share it. What's, what's the Facebook page that you're posting things to? Uh, I'm putting things in chat, but any resources that are linked here, we'll put them into, should we put them in the Kingdom group, Chibuso? Yeah. Um, we, we have two different Facebooks. One is a group um, that is very large, like almost 450 people are participating in it. And it's very much like a news of the day um, group where we talk um, and engage each other on what's happening in the world related to racial justice. And the group that is was created to go alongside our organizing clinics is the Mutually Accountable Kingdom Seekers group, which I added everyone that's on this call to if they weren't already on it. So you, if you go to Facebook and go to your groups, it should be listed there. Um, and I'm going to embed it into the um, chat link for those who have chat. It won't help you, Dean, because you're on a phone, but for, uh, or Kimberly, but everyone that has their access to the laptop, um, it's now in the uh, chat box, as is the Movement for Black Lives glossary. And I can yeah. also send these materials out in a follow-up email if that's helpful. Excellent, excellent. That glossary I sent is helpful for <coughs> understanding the Black Lives Matter movement as such, but the kind of introductory prejudice and racism, that's, it's, that it's not the right glossary. So um, we might be able to identify that. Like maybe Radia could find one that's online that would be a more introductory level glossary to send out as part of the follow-up info. Mm. Um, okay, so we've got... Um, Enough time for one or two more folks to take some time in the center. Uh, who'd like to? I guess I, I have a, I, an anecdote or two. Yesterday I was driving with someone from the church in Flint. We were going to the grocery store to pick up some food, and one of the uh, young men that has been uh, assigned to work with us in Flint, it's a paying job, and he's distributing water. And uh, he, he had hopped in the car um, to go grocery shopping with us. And uh, his, his uh, co-workers and the person who was kind of providing oversight for the workforce said, no, you've got to come to come back to work. And uh, so as this elderly uh, church member and I were driving out, he said, oh, he was just trying to get out of work which I, I know this young man, and, and yes, that's what he was trying to do. But the next statement um, raises a question in my mind about how we talk to our elders um, in a way that's respectful and insightful and loving, and how to go about finding the context to tell the truth. Because the statement was, he was just trying to get out of work, and that followed, that's why 58% of black young men are unemployed in Flint. Um, and that's, that's just the way he put it. And, uh, you know, he would swear up and down. He's not prejudiced. His observations of course would be informing that statement, uh, which would be vocalized or verbalized without any, uh, critical thinking, without any deep thought. In other words, observes is, you know how it works. He observes something, he puts it into a context that's comfortable, familiar with him, and then he associates it with, uh, not with the fact of institutionalized racism, but what's wrong with black youth today. And uh, so finding a way to, to, to talk about that with uh, some of the elderly folks and some of the middle class, I mean really just with some folks in Church of the Brethren, how to try and start working to provide a different context, recognition of how what we say is tainted by some thinking that's just not true. 
the things that we know to be true tend not to be true because we never can. And we don't question why or how we believe they're true. I'm looking for a way outside of workshops, but just in conversations to, to really begin having these, these conversations to challenge some of the thinking like that. Um, so that was one thing that happened yesterday, and, and it's in one of the congregations that I'm working, you know, that, in Flint that I'm working with. And uh, I think the other one, when I think about justice, and, and I'll try to be brief with this, is a lot of people were constantly saying how just it would be for John Engler to come drink the water in Flint or John Engler to go to jail. I don't think jail is justice for anyone. Um, it, it might be preferable to having to spend our time with people I don't, we don't like. But real justice may have been John Engler having to give up access to all of his resources and live in that neighborhood and not only drink the water, but not have access to credit, not have access to a good education, not have access to a living wage. And so when I, when I wrote that, I don't know if I'd like what justice looks like. It's because when most of us think of justice, we tend to look at it from a perspective that includes us as being part of the good guys. And I hate to, to take up the Apostle Paul's thinking, but when we start thinking of ourselves as one of the good guys, we automatically place people like the elder that I talked to yesterday in a category of bad guys. And I'd really not like to, not like to do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of my contribution for today. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Uh, one thing I left on there, if you want to jump in, Chibusa, but I was just going to say people could explore what Scott was bringing uh, for about another minute. Yeah, I was just going to respond to Scott. Um, I, I think the two things that you mentioned are really intertwined and important um, because I think one of the biggest barriers is that we think people's experiences are like ours. And your elder friend needs to understand how vastly different his life is than persons of color. I walk through this world as a man, and so I'm not going to be able to effectively support Radia or Barb by assuming that their experience is like mine, because it's vastly different, um, vastly different. And so it's like what you said there, and the second piece, it's not as simple as, oh, 58% of the blacks in Flint are unemployed, that does make it seem like they're lazy if your assumption is their experience of the world is like yours as a white male. That's, but we know that that's not the case. And so if you realize that blacks are killed at a higher rate and put in prison at a higher rate, then you're dealing with women who are single parents, often having to work two jobs, when do they have time to do these, you know, different things? I mean, there's just a, when, when you get out of prison, you can't get work because you have to check a box that says you're a felon. I mean, like, it's this huge, vastly different experience that we as uh, black and brown people have. And it's the same for any marginalized group. If you, the way that you operate in the world is directly tied to your sexuality, your um, class, your gender, your race, all of these things inform us. And it's not that that over is a bad person or is a bad guy or is evil or that we needed to, to demean him. Um, it's that his experience is his own experience. Um, and so I, I think it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about that um, and maybe even not even starting around race. I think for a lot of people it's easy to talk about gender than it is for race. And if you can get a white man to, it, to understand that he has male privilege, it's going to be a lot easier for you to get him to understand that he has white privilege. Uh, Matt in the chat just posted uh, about you know the problems with folks having felonies and not being able to and so I, what, it, what it is is finding a, a safe place for him to talk about this without having to, because, without having him feeling like he has to defend himself. And that has been my problem. It, it's not lacking, and I don't believe you're suggesting this, but I don't lack knowledge in, 
and why we experience these outcomes. I lack experience in how to state them with, just as you said, state them in a way that can be heard or listened to by people whose reality is not only entirely different, but, but really limited. Um, and, and finding anecdotes that can help urge, I, I think Matt had posted something about telling parables. You know, how can I story tell in a way that maybe gets folks to think, um, I would hate to use sermons for that, but why? Why would I not want to use a sermon for that? Um, so these are these are questions and yeah you know it's an interesting like the the question that you're asking about what's the communication strategy that's going to get through to this person is um is one that requires us to think about them and where they are and what's going to be effective and i know for me sometimes when i'm in my righteous indignation i just want to tell people what they need to know but that might not always be the approach that's going to be effective. And so, um, yeah, th that's why I found myself thinking about Jesus and parables is he found ways to not just, he did denounce and teach, but he also told kind of surprising stories that opened up new ways of seeing. And, and it makes me, I just, in conflict recently, I've been challenging myself to step back and say, okay, this is what I'm pissed about. This is how I feel. This is what I wish they knew. Now, what am I going to do that's actually going to help versus escalating the unhelpfulness? So we have about five minutes left in this um, broad group sharing. Um, there's uh, two options. One is if there's someone who's really um, in, in a in a real clear way you want to take five minutes because you've got something you want to work on th this would be the time for that there's time for you the other one is that we could talk around these themes of communication and education which have been rising up in the conversation and we could just have more of an open conversation hear from a couple people we haven't heard from so is there someone who wants to take the time or should we just open it up to a general conversation for the next five or six minutes? Open it up. Okay. So who'd like to speak to these questions? We've got these themes and almost all the comments today about how do I communicate with people who are different than me, um, who come from different experiences, how do I do the education work that's necessary to get people ready so I can organize them? And I'd just like to hear either things that you've learned about that or what, what you want to add that can bring some more light to this conversation. Um, so I think this kind of, I want to read the comment that Barb left and then just expand on that really quickly. She says, on a side note, someone explained the Black Lives Matter movement to me as follows. When a house is on fire, firefighters rush to put out that fire. That house matters. And yes, all houses matter, but that's the house that's on fire. Um, and I think we've heard different analogies. Uh, you know, there's this whole Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter debate. And we've heard the different analogies. Um, you know, we don't run through cancer fundraisers and say things like other diseases matter we know that right um and so i think this speaks a little bit to Chico's point about privilege i think that what sometimes helps i mean you know it's unfortunate or not but i think sometimes we have to take race out of the equation and just have a straight up conversation like seeing that i think makes perfect sense. Maybe it's because I'm a woman, maybe it's because I'm a black woman, I'm not really sure. But I just find that in the conversations that I've had when I've done a different comparison, so going back to like the storytelling and the parables, and I've taken race out of the equation, and have made people just think about it based on 
something in everyday life, like a house being on fire or someone having cancer, they step back and say, oh, oh, wait, well, okay, yeah, that actually does make sense. So maybe it's just that there's you know, we've, we've had these conversations, I think, in the Facebook group as well, but maybe there's just that discomfort with just confronting race up front. And so to get the conversation started, that needs to be taken out of the equation. And then once there's that general understanding, we can bring it back in. One of the things I found myself reflecting about is a strategic question about this prejudice versus racism. And I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about all the pushback against political correctness, which I think, I don't know, I'm trying to be sympathetic to the pushback is a pushback around, well, don't tell me how to talk or think. And I think that when I think about, well, what did, what provoked that? It was probably trying to intervene exactly with like at the prejudice level versus at the systemic racism level. And so we've spent 30 years trying to get people to like not use the N word. And in the meantime, haven't built a movement where people understand the structural problems. And so I'm wondering if it's almost like making a strategic choice that when you're organizing, you let some of the prejudice stuff go in order to get to the heart of the matter because there may be some people that would agree that there's systemic problems, but they're going to keep their paternalistic or slightly prejudiced attitude at the beginning. And do we want them in the movement unraveling things or do we want them to be perfect in how they communicate at the beginning? I've never thought about this this way before, so I'm really curious what other people think about it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, Scott, are you trying to talk? I was just I was going to say that one of my biggest problems in building relationships is is I am um, impossibly authentic, and it often means that it becomes too easy for me to be one of the guys. And one example in response to what Matt was saying is. You know, uh, growing up in a neighborhood where we would, could identify certain people by certain walks and using derogatory terms for those walks, the fact that I'll be in a relationship that work with some guys not wanting to be the white guy that corrects six, six African Americans at work about what's right and wrong to say about people, I will tend not only to be quiet, but in too many ways be one of the guys laughing along. I think I tend to get caught in this. Uh, I want to be authentic and it's easy for me to be authentic. And I'm reminded that when I am authentic, I often don't think about women's issues. When I am authentic, I'm often not thinking about gay or lesbian issues. That's not to say that I don't understand them. It doesn't mean that they're not important to me. These are not issues that I'm always thinking about. And I worry about being overwhelming to people when I am consistently trying to be right. My problem is, is that I'm not quite willing to go the extra mile by even modeling what's right and looking for someone to keep me accountable in that uh, in certain situations is something that I need to focus on. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. And thanks everybody for this great conversation. We're going to move to the next piece of our agenda which I'm going to toss the ball to Chibuso. Um, and I put the link in there to the Facebook group, which I think we'll be using for this next piece. So Chibuso, take it away. Yeah, so um, the link is in the chat. It's actually in there twice. Um, both of us have put it in there. Um, if you are on your phone like Dean and you're not able to jump on there, grab a pen and paper. Um, this is the portion of our call where we try to um, put – this into action. So if, I don't know how other people operate like at a Bible study. Whenever I'm leading a Bible study, I always end with you know, application questions and, and wanting people to actually have tangible, measurable things that they can um, take away from the study. Well, that's the same thing we want from these clinics. 
Um, it's great if Dean says, I want to become more open to other people's viewpoints. Right, right. That's everyone can agree. That's a nice, positive thing. How do we, how do we um, measure that? How do we uh, hold each other accountable for something like that? Well, that's very hard to do because that's sort of a nebulous um, goal to be more open. Um, so we are looking for things. Um, and if you go into the, uh, if you click on the link to the Facebook group, you will be able to see um, some of what people are sharing um, in the, if you scroll down to where you see um, a, it's like a cartoon image. Um, it's got a black woman um, sitting at a chair and it says, I'm an organizer. You can scroll down to that and you'll take just the next like two minutes and read through the comments there so you can see what people wrote as their goals for the past month. And then I'm going to invite you to write your own goals in a minute. Anyone can take just a moment and um, share any observation that you glean from um, reading the goals. Where do I find the goals? Um, they're on. Are you on Facebook? Yeah, I just got. I just got on. Yeah, it's in. Uh -huh. I can send you a direct link uh, to the chat. Are you on? Are you in Facebook right now? Yes, I am. Okay, I'll send you a message that has a direct link to the chat. Are others seeing where this is, though? Oh, it looks like we're not friends. We're about to become friends, Dean. Okay. <laughs> The direct link is in our chat, too. Are folks seeing where we are? Yep. On that link, yeah. Yeah, can anyone just share and observate? Because I'm not asking you to put your goals there. I'm still trying to make sure we're all on the same page about what goals look like. So can anyone just share an observation, having read the comments, the goals that people have put there? Can you share um, an observation that you have? What's something that ties those goals together? How does how did those goals differ from the sort of broad, vague example I gave of trying to be more open? Well, one thing I notice is many of them are very specific. Like you can tell if you did it or not. Mm -hmm. Like. And so, which means, you know, I've heard at least three people talk about accountability on this call. And if you say, here's what I'm going to do, then at the very basic level, you can hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And you can ask someone to hold you accountable for did I convene a meeting or not? And that doesn't always mean a gotcha type thing. It's just like, I didn't, and here's why. But it, as opposed to, you can just never, never reflect on it with anybody. So one of the things that you can see if you're looking in the comments is Bill says that his goal is to attend the first event with the Black Lives Matter group in his county. Then he posts um, a picture from the meeting and shares uh, another uh, news article about the um, group. It's being able to show like this is what we are doing. Um, and then when I prodded further, he shares even more. Um, that's, that's the type of thing that we are um, looking for, is something that um, is quantifiable in that regard. What, something that just is really exciting, Chibuso, that you're helping me see a possibility for, and Bill's example is like, if you want to be accountable for something, what is it that you can take a picture of? Like, can we each post a picture every month? That's like, I'm going to, even if it's like, I'm going to stand up and make an announcement about the book group, then I'm going to get a picture of me and one other person from my congregation and a photo of me holding the book saying, I did it. Yep. It's a really easy and social media friendly form of accountability. I never thought about that. Definitely. I think that that's awesome. So if you go back to the top of the um, page, you'll see... Um, a post, it says, here's our organizers from 825's clinic. Please share your goals in the comment section. And you'll see a um, screenshot um, that's oh so flattering of all of us. Um, and you can write in the comments what your goals are. So just take um, the next few um, minutes to try to synthesize what you've heard and formulate that into something that you can write down as a tangible goal. And it doesn't need to be, you know, super um, large. I would imagine that Matt, Radia, and my um, goals will be perhaps more complex than um, others. We're doing this as our job and you're doing this as um, lay people who are concerned. Um, so whatever that might look like for you, add your comments. And it would be helpful if we make sure that we're posting these things, not in the one that we read through, but at the top of the group discussion board where it has the picture of a screenshot of all of us. I don't know how to do this. Um, Barb, if you, I'm going to pin the post, <laughs> and Good. so if you just take your scroll bar um, and scroll up to the very top. Ah, like right here, like that. And do, you, do you see up at the top? a picture that is that looks like us I don't see me but I see the rest of you am I talking am I are muted? you on, on the Facebook or are you looking at zoom I'm at on Facebook you're in this picture I see Matt I see Bill I see Scott oh, Miller. You're, you're looking at the previous one let me put the permalink for the one he's talking about okay. in the chat on zoom so look for it there okay Aha, uh -huh. I see it now.
Are you able to see that post? Yeah, I see it. Is that where you want it? It's not, but that's okay. I'll cop. That's what we did last time. I'll copy it, put it where I want it. Okay. But I see four comments there. Um, Matt, are you wanting us to transition into um, sharing about upcoming events? I can't hear you because you're muted. So I don't know if you're affirming that or not. Yes, I am affirming it. I'm, I'm wrapped up in writing my goals. So that's I'll okay. Start. That's okay. Um, um, want me to go ahead? Go. Yeah. So the next time we do this same thing again is Thursday, September 22nd. And we're doing it at 8 p.m. Eastern. So it's going to be a different time than this go around. Um, so if we have folks that are in um, Central, you're going to be looking at 7, and you're going to be looking at 5 p.m. on the West Coast. Uh, but we would love to have all of you um, for the next round. And be sure to invite others. As you can see, I brought a friend. And uh, <laughs> so all of you have um, uh, church folks, um, co-workers, maybe um, you're on the West Coast and 5 o'clock is when you get off and you want to have your cubicle partner stay late an hour and a half and you'll come and participate with us. Um, think of creative ways to engage um, and I really love Matt's suggestion about photos and so I'm looking forward to seeing all of your um, photos of your proof of what you have done. Um, the Kenyan um, community of practice has a tools for organizing and mobilizing web event that's going to be happening on the 20th of September. So that's a Tuesday at 7 p.m. Matt, do you have a link that you can share um, for folks to start registering for that? I sure wish I did, but Radia will have it in about uh, 36 hours. So. Okay, so when Radia sends out her um, email follow-up um, in the next couple days, she'll include um, the link so all of you can get connected as well um, to the Kenya Nonviolence Community of Practice. Matt, anything else? I don't think so. Did you say follow-up one-to-ones? Oh yeah, I, one of the things that we try to do is um, can reconnect and just get your, partly to get your impression of how you experience the web event, but also to give you some more concrete encouragement and support. So I will be following up um, with all of you and if um, you live not that far, I'd be happy to meet um, with you in person for coffee um, or lunch and if you're at a distance, um, we can meet again via Zoom, but in a more private um, way. So look, look um, forward. And, to and one other thing that I'll mention is um, we're the Black Lives Matter movement 
you didn't talk about this, did you? The movement for Black Lives. No, moving towards that. Okay, I was just making sure that I didn't space out. Um, the movement for Black Lives, a coalition of groups involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, recently released a policy document that's broader than the one that came out last year that was called Campaign Zero, that was mainly focused on, on policing. And um, because we try to be accountable to that movement, we're still figuring out what that looks like, we're trying to incorporate um, reference to those goals and um, education about those goals in the work that we do in this ministry. And so we are, Radia and Chibuso and I are at the drawing board stage on a series of web events or some other way to engage that policy document. I wanted to, first of all, just let you know it exists in case you had missed it so that you can just read it and know that it's there. But also, um, if you have counsel for us related to how to work with it on a, on a call like this, we'd love to hear it, so. Awesome, great. Um, does anyone feel led to provide a benediction or some type of spiritual close, however you're led? If not, can we take a moment of silence in remembrance of all those who aren't with us. For Michael Brown, Eric Gardner, John Crawford III, Sandra Bland, and countless others. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, amen. Thanks everybody. Adios. For those who want to stick around for a couple minutes to debrief this call, we always spend just a few minutes right after the call as a staff um, because we're doing it again next month. And so we're always trying to up our game. So um, if you would like to stick around and think about what worked well or what could be improved next time, you're welcome to stay. And otherwise, peace. Um, and staff, I'm going to take these notes in the bottom of the agenda document from this month. Um, well, for those of you who stuck around, what do you got for us? What you think, Jonathan? Jonathan's giving a thumbs up. What thumbed up in particular for you, my um, brother? I think just having space for people to like speak in the center, um, someone for me to hear sort of where people are struggling, they're um, organizing work. I'm one of those folks that joined as a, let's, let's see what it's kind of like, so to see how it fits with what I'm called to do. Um, particularly I'm interested in environmental issues and so one of the areas I'm thinking about looking into is environmental justice um, as well as like local food movements how to how to empower people to have access to healthy food um, and so for me to hear different stories from people who are already in the work I thought was very helpful for me to identify where I could grow as well as maybe some strengths that I have um, in this area Thanks. Mm -hmm. Jonathan and I are both a part of Bethany's Seminary Stewardship Alliance group, and at this upcoming presidential forum, which is on um, creation care, Jonathan and I are leading um, one of the uh, plenaries where we'll be going back and forth. Um, he'll be sharing a rural approach to food justice, and I'll be sharing an urban approach to food justice and going back and forth. So. 
that's part of the story between Jonathan and I. As far as today's uh, meeting, it, for me personally, I felt much more comfortable. It, it went more smoothly because I'm used to it. I uh, enjoyed the conversation. Um, this month's suggestion is finding a time. I would like to find a way to try and pick out a specific topic where we have uh, a lengthier time to discuss especially uh, with the leadership choosing the topic and um, inviting some questions or some sharing and then responding. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what that looks like entirely other than I would like to have the ability to explore some of the issues that come up during this a little more in depth. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. And actually, I mean, it's, it could be a tweak to the way this is working now, which is to say we're having our organizer clinic and it'll have the same accountability as normal, but we'll, um, this month we're really going to be talking about white people working with other white people or whatever a topic like effective methods of education. And it, so it could be, I mean, that's one way to do it. It could also be just a totally different thematic presentation and discussion. Cool. And I think having that theme could be helpful. Um, I mean, every time we've done this, there have been a several people who registered who didn't show up. And I think part of that is if you know that this is uh, something that happens every month and it's not like that big of a deal, if you miss it, you can jump on the next one. But if we publicize that we're doing a particular topic, so-and-so may be like, oh, this is really pertinent to me. I want to make sure that I'm at this month's clinic. Um, this is an, an idea, an affirmation of Scott's concern. Yeah, I mean, speaking about well, what you just... Example, oh, sorry, go ahead, Scott. One of the things I was thinking of is like a half-hour discussion of what prejudice is. How prejudice serves us by it's important not only to recognize that we have it, but uh, uh, why we have it, why it's necessary for being human, and why we are designed to be able to overcome it. Um, you know, other things are uh, what does it mean? What does privilege mean? Um, and in a Christian context, what does it mean? So, explain a little more in that might help us unpack some of the differences in the way we view or in the way that we come to uh, the issue at home. Yeah, good. Thanks. Uh, Other things about this meeting well, or that we want to unpack a little bit. On the note of attendance, I mean, we literally had 12 people registered who did not show up. So that's like more than who were here. And so that's, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. There are some people there who have registered before and not shown up. Um, did anyone send you emails today, Radia? Like they're having a hard time getting in or anything like that? No, um, I, you know, I, I wonder if it has something to do with the time. I did get a couple of regrets like yesterday and earlier this week with people realizing, oh, I have to work at that time or I have something to do. Um, so, I, you know, I've only been on one other call and that one was at eight, I think. And I think we had more people then. So I don't know if because it's later in the evening and a lot of people aren't at work or what those circumstances are. But I think that's why um, it's good to kind of fluctuate the times to kind of see what works. Um, but I think maybe that has something to do with it. We had several people who haven't been on one before today. I Who were like I'm thinking Barb was a newcomer. Mm -hmm. Scott, Dean. I think you've been on one of these before. Yeah. But Dean was new. Dean was we new. Had a conversation about the book, but this is the first time he's been on this. Barb right. was new. Jonathan was new. Yeah. 
What were you going to say, Bill? I wonder, I wonder if um, we're at a point where we have a large enough pool of people participants, of potential participants, that we start using doodle poll mechanisms um, to advance schedule these things. We may be at a point where we need a daytime one like this that allows some people to come who can't come at night, and evening ones allow other people to come who can't come in the day. Um, I think that this particular one seemed to be a very satisfying activity for the people who are here. I mean, they really were engaging questions that are directly meaningful to them. Uh, they were getting help and resource and hearing. Um, so it, that also applies to the question of the topic, too. We might have a mix of topical and non-topical ones, um, because if we're on a topic, it can cut both ways. We could lose people who say, yeah, I like these, but I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to be part of that topic. Um, well, the model that we've got, that we just aren't doing all the parts of it right now because for various reasons, includes teaching and training calls, which Chabusa just mentioned in the chat. And so it's just a different kind of call than the organizing clinic. And in terms of the time zone, what we've been intentionally doing is alternating the time of day when this happens. So for, that's why next month is at 7 p.m. Eastern time instead of at noon. Now, it's an interesting thought to say every month we're going to do one that's early and one that's late so that people who, for whom one of those works get their organizing clinic every month. I think that's something for Chibusa and Rodia and I to really talk about. Because once we've got the agenda, I mean, we can do it. It doesn't take that much more other than we're registering people, you know, so... Radia, with your experience with registering people for events and everything, I would just wonder what insight you have about the like 12 no-shows. So, I mean, it's an, it could be a number of things. Um, I think, well, and I don't know how, what has happened in the past, but what I've found with no-shows typically is that they know that it's being recorded and they know that they're going to receive some kind of follow-up material. Right. So they register for the purpose of whether I can attend or not, like I'll get those follow-up materials and I can just look at that in my, you know, at my leisure in my own free time. Um, so I'm thinking it's that it's probably time of day. So that's something worth exploring. Um, but that's, I mean, that's really all I have. I think that folks just, you know, they want the information, but they want it at their leisure. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I know I do that with larger national calls where I think I'm going to be anonymous. And so maybe I'm just applying a different lens because this is more personalized, but people don't necessarily know this, right. that know that. Like there's a bunch of people who signed up this time who had never been to one, so they don't even know what it's like. So. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, too, I mean, once we start, we've already been talking about YouTube and getting things on. I think that will allow us to further our reach, too. If we have a condensed version of a teaching and training call, if we see that, oh, it's only got 20 views, you know, after three months, we can say, oh, well, that's the same 20, you know, Sharon Floor looked at that. And, you know, like the same usual suspects. But if we start seeing that, we have, you know, over a hundred people who are looking at something that we've produced. Um, we can see that that's going much broader than the usual suspects who come onto this call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Matt, since you've been, since we've been doing this together for some time and you were doing the relational call that was sort of gave birth to this with Zoe, how do you, Thing. Oh, I think uh, like I'm I'm thrilled about where things are. I mean, there are always ways to make things better, but in terms of like I think that every month we're getting tighter in terms of how the accountability piece works. Like that went way. It was like way more um, obviously engaging to people today. I think that your innovation to say, let's look at last month's goals. What observations do you have? Now let's think it was like getting people back into the stream of thinking that way. 
And um, uh, yeah, I just think we're building it and it's getting better. So. And, if, and next time I'll be on top of the permalinks, you know, and then it'll be smooth right. for those that aren't as social media illiterate. So I mean, like, I think I agree that every, every time there's an opportunity to get better. I think one of the things that I'm still like wondering about is there's always people who connect via phone or some other way. And I think that we need to say there, there will be visual and chat elements in this call. You may connect via phone, but you will not have the full experience or something like that because I mean, we read the chat out, but it, people just miss things if they only call in via phone. And I don't know what to. Right. When you screen share, they don't have access to that. Anything right. that's in the chat, you, we don't have access to. And we don't read out everything. We don't read out like the who we are and where, like the first activity was checking in to see who was there, where we're from. Like you don't get all of that if you're not in the chat. You don't have, I mean, Dean was able to get on a computer to do the Facebook thing at least but he missed out on, out on a lot of other aspects and like Kimberly wouldn't have been able to see, you know, do any of that. So I totally agree. I'd like to add an observation and maybe get a brief line of feedback is that I know that myself, I enjoy this. It's still not my milieu. I also understand that this is the way people communicate now and it's a good thing. This opens up a lot of opportunities. But I think as far as participation um, and about the benefits of this is not just limiting it to online participation, but, but trying to record it or do this in a manner so that there are a lot of people that prefer face-to-face -face contact. And this can also be, the recording of these sessions can also be used to facilitate face-to-face -face discussions whether it's in the church or in the community center with Church of the Brethren people who um, are Quakers or whoever who aren't just going to sit in front of a computer for an hour and a half that aren't used to that. But also, I know that I feel more comfortable and um, more relational when I'm able to sit down face-to-face -face with somebody. And I think that uh, there are people out there that would be interested if this can be a tool for congregations to use uh, for fa delivering face-to-face -face workshops or information or leading groups. I don't know what that would look like. But well, Rudia, you've really been pushing us towards getting it all up, getting it all up there and uh, available. And I think Scott's pressing towards a possible use for mm -hmm. that, which is that if Scott knows that there's going to be a five minute pep talk about organizing or something like that in the call, and you just have to pull it up on YouTube and it's at minute 12, he can just use it in his group. Perfect. We, could, we could plan for that. Or like, here's the spiritual power moment. Like here's the spiritual power moment and the organizer pep talk of the month. And it's 10 minutes of content. And then you use it in your meeting. Mm -hmm. Maybe a YouTube channel. Uh